Colonel Vindman, you are one of those people who, who you came from a part of the world that was not enjoying democracy, and you saw something, as a, as a person who worked in, in, in the administration, you saw something that felt dishonest, and you stood up. You had something to lose, and you did lose something. You lost your career um, for doing it. But that was what you, when you said, we can't have this lawlessness that goes on in the other parts of the world in America. Well, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we're seeing both uh, Trump telegraph the kind of world he wants to live in, and then we don't have to use our imagination too hard because we could see that world manifest in front of us because he, he, Trump tells us he wants to uh, emulate Vladimir Putin. And in that, we see what life could be like. We see a world in which um, Trump would like to eliminate his opposition. He'd like to imprison them, poison them, potentially murder them, mass deportation. We saw that play out in re regards to Russia. And what I fear and what I frankly uh, desperately hope doesn't happen is that we don't have to have our population come out in, the, in thousands or tens of thousands to protest against uh, uh, barbarism in the United States. Uh, it's, it's striking that over the course of two years of war, Putin has done everything he could to suppress that population, to oppress that population and think he's cowed them. And clearly that's yep. not the case. People were out on the street chanting against the war, chanting for, um, for Alexei Navalny and for a different vision of Russia. And again, I do, do not wish to see anything like that happen in the United States. And that's why you hear me and you hear Ambassador McFaul, who I had the privilege of, of serving with in, in Moscow, uh, are so focused on making sure that war over there doesn't come home to the United States, that our troops that aren't getting, uh, don't get pulled in and that we protect democracy at home. Ambassador, let's talk about this idea that we are two weeks away from an election in which there has never been any doubt that Vladimir Putin will be the victor. Why does this stuff still happen? Why are those people prepared to go out there? They know who the next president of Russia is going to be. They know from, as Colonel uh, Vindman said, they know from the outbreak of the Ukraine war and other uh, demonstrations in favor of Navalny or supporting his efforts. They know you can go to jail for this in Russia, and yet they come. Yet they come knowing that they may face arrest or harassment or worse. Well, I have deep admiration for all the people that did come on this horrific day for all of Russia, uh, for the Navalny family, for me personally. I knew I know the Navalny family. I knew Alexei personally for many years. He was a tremendously talented leader. He was the Mandela. Uh, he was the Havel. He was the Valenza uh, of his country with one horrible, tragic difference. He was killed in prison. He was not released. And to answer your question, uh, I would say, uh, just remember what Navalny said in the movie at the end of it. If they have to kill me, and if I'm dead, that means we're stronger than, than you know we are. Then you, that we're stronger than you think we are. Uh, something to that effect. And I think what you saw today, because you're absolutely right, every single one of those people are being photographed, they can go to jail for years for what they were chanting. I have friends in jail in Russia right now who have gone to jail for years for chanting what they said, but they are defying him. And for everyone that was there, there are many, many more sitting in their kitchens that are afraid but have exactly the same preferences. And I think we have to remember that not all Russians think like Putin, mm -hmm. not all Russians support Putin. Uh, uh, Vladimir Karamursa told me, uh, Colonel Vindman, he told me years ago, he said, when, when talking about these stories, don't say Russians. Talk about Putin. Talk about the Russian administration. Don't paint all Russians with the same brush. And the same thing can be said for America right now, for a lot of people around the world who are looking at us saying, what are you people doing? It's not all of us people. There are people in America who protest every day. There are people who protest the injustices, who, are, who fight it by running for office, who fight it by being in office. Um, so this is, this is not a fight we have lost in America yet. We have the vote. Our vote actually does matter. And we can make changes. But it takes acts of courage to do this. I think that's true. I think, frankly, we, we might have only one more vote left that really matters. If, uh, if Trump comes to office, he's already declared that he intends to be a dictator. Uh, the president and the chief executive is invested with in, in broad powers. And uh, it, it's not easy to undo American democracy that's been around for nearly 250 years. But a, a lot of damage has been done, and, and President Trump has every intention to do that. So we have uh, one more vote. We need to make sure our population shows up. So like this, we don't have to face those, those challenges in, in the oppression 
that you know the, the Russians are facing. I think the fact is that between now and then, it's going to be a particularly different, uh, difficult period. There are steps that need to be taken to make sure that the war in between Russia and Ukraine doesn't spill over, doesn't magnify, that the highest risk of that happening, frankly, is if Ukraine doesn't get support. The Republican Party must show up in, uh, in an effort to support and advance U.S. national security and pass a Ukraine aid package, uh, same aid package that would support Taiwan and Israel. But it's critically important that Ukraine gets aid. Otherwise, there's a very, very big risk that, it, that the war could spill over. Uh, President Macron of France alluded to something of this nature, a worst-case scenario in the absence of the, of the U.S., in which Europe has no choice but to face off against Russia in Ukraine, so like this, they don't have to face off against Russia right. on their own territory. So this is an important point you bring up, because one would say President Macron, uh, ambassador, is the president of France, a NATO country. Why would Russia go into a NATO country? I want to remind our viewers of what Donald Trump said uh, on February 10th in South Carolina uh, about uh, a, a nameless uh, NATO leader who said, if, you know, if we don't pay what you say we're supposed to pay, which is a sort of a, a misrepresentation to start with, uh, will, will you protect us if, if Russia does something? And here's what former President Trump said. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. So there you have it, uh, Ambassador. As the colonel says, we don't have to really uh, stretch our minds too much to imagine what Donald Trump would do in, in these cases, because he tells us what he would do. Well, he does, and that is really scary for me for the following reasons. Um, he may say that, and he may encourage Putin to go in to one of the countries on the border there. But the idea that we will stay out of that conflict, that is naive beyond uh, imagination. It reminds me of the 1930s, when people just like Trump said, that's not our problem over there. Doesn't matter what the Italians are doing in Ethiopia or the Japanese in China or Hitler in Poland. And then it became our problem. Right. And I was just in Munich last week, speaking to leaders from that part of the world and in Vilnius the month before. They are scared to death of that scenario when Putin tests our commitment to Article 5 and we have a president perhaps like Mr. Trump. And it is naive for Americans to think that we will be able to keep out of a war in Europe. Better to be strong now, Ronald Reagan said it, peace through strength, than to wait for that scenario to play out. And don't believe me, just go back and read what happened in the 1930s, yes. punctuated uh, by what happened to us in 1941. Ali, Ali if I could come yep. in on this. I just want to, I mean, the danger is frankly more real than that. This is not a what if scenario. What happens if Donald Trump is back in office in 2025? The threat is real because what Donald Trump has done is he's offered a signal that the Republican Party, not just Trump in the future, but the Republican Party today would not show up in the event of an attack on NATO. And that's, a, that's a recipe for disaster. That's an invitation for Putin to test that resolve. He's been wanting to destroy NATO for the whole time to test that resolve. And that's a recipe for our troops to be in danger today, because we would defend him, but he might not perceive it that way. And that's the same kind of scenario that unfolded in the month, weeks and months before February 2022, where, where Putin believed he saw the signal that the Republican Party, the, the political establishment in the United States wouldn't show up, and he struck. He struck out at Ukraine. We are kind of in that same situation now. It is very dangerous, it is very real. And even in the num months before this election, I think our troops are now in much greater danger than they were beforehand. That's a remarkable before perspective on that. Uh, Ambassador, you, you and Colonel Vindman are both students of history. Uh, one doesn't have to go too far back in history. You can go back to uh, September 11th, 2001, to the one and only time that Article 5, the mutual defense uh, article in, of NATO, was invoked. And it was in invoked in the defense of the United States of America by every other member nation who said, you have been attacked, so we have been attacked. We're here for you. That's right. I'm glad you reminded me, uh, everyone, of that. I don't think Mr. Trump understands that. And by the way, they didn't just invoke Article 5. They send their soldiers to fight with us and to die with us in Afghanistan. So when I hear all this debate about 1%, 2.1%, I want to remind everybody that our NATO allies died for us. Mm -hmm. We have not had to fight for them, and we're all better off. The one great advantage we have as the United States of America when dealing with Russia or dealing with China 
are our allies. Mm -hmm. It's our one superpower. We have allies and they don't. So why Donald Trump doesn't understand that basic fact about our national security? I know the Republicans do around him. I know they're just afraid of him. Uh, I wish they would speak up. Um, and, it, and to go back to your analogies between Trump and Putin, I actually wrote a piece about that, Ali, in February of 2017. And it wasn't uh, how in Russia, the civil society activists were there, the opposition parties were there. You know who was quiet? It was the people in his party, the oligarchs, mm -hmm. uh, and those that allegedly listened to his Christian values, right? Well, he's not so bad. He's going to cut our taxes, and he speaks about Christian things that we care about. That's what they said in the early years of Putin, and it's eerily yep. uh, similar to what I hear now. So it's those people being silent that need to speak up before it's too late.